right. Well, I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk and uh, tell you a little bit about a strategy that we're trying to develop to help make foundational new scientific discoveries that yield practical, deployable technologies to help improve the human condition. Now, why do we... Let's see if this works. Um, hmm. Okay, great. So why is it so hard to go all the way from neuroscience to practical brain technology? Well, I think one part of the problem is the incredibly complex spatial scale of the brain. Brain cells are enormous. They're centimeters in spatial extent, by far the biggest cells in the human body. But if you care about how brain cells communicate with each other, how they compute, you care about nanoscale things, even individual molecules. So how the heck can you see across all these spatial scales, from molecule to cell to brain? This is very, very difficult to do. And the other problem is time. Brain cells compute with very high-speed electrical pulses, called spikes, and they communicate with high-speed electrical and chemical communications. So in some ways, I think the problem of solving the brain is a problem of crossing space and time. We need to understand how the elementary building blocks of what happens in the brain yield things like feelings and memory and decisions, and how these things go wrong in conditions like Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, and how we can use our understanding to make the brain better. So I think this topic needs no introduction for this audience, but of course brain diseases present huge unmet medical need, and as befits the theme of this conference, also can you go beyond? Can we feel more enlightened, perform better? But even if you just look at the medical need, it's enormous. No brain disease can be fully cured, and the treatments that exist are pretty partial, and they have a lot of side effects. In fact, here's some numbers from an editorial from Science Magazine about 10 years ago. I think the numbers are even more um, uh, worrisome now, but at the time, they were commenting that developing brain therapies takes almost a decade. The failure rate is really, really high, over 90% to get regulatory approval. The cost is enormous. I think the number is twice as much nowadays. And as I said earlier, the effects are pretty uh, often partial, uh, incomplete, and have side effects. So in some ways, I think we have a moral imperative to get out there, throw our hat in the ring, and try to figure out what we can do about this. And so you put two and two together, if the reason that these problems are so hard, the reason we don't have full cures, the reason the treatments are so poor, is because of the spatial and temporal complexity of the brain, why don't we build tools that directly confront the hard science behind that spatial and temporal complexity? Now you might say, okay, if you build tools for scientific discovery, how does that yield an actual practical therapy or augmentatory technology? And so we thought about this for a long time in our group. There's a sort of traditional translational path. You see somebody develop a technology, maybe in a laboratory, maybe in a university, and then you have a translational component where you spin it out, you do the cl clinical trials, and you see if it works. There's also the science side. A biologist makes a great discovery, you translate that into the clinic. But in some ways, if the science is hard, we need a three-step process, not a two-step process. And so I'd like to describe what we do as a three-stage process. First, step one, invent a tool that has the capability to reveal science that nobody's seen before. Maybe we can see something more precisely than ever before, or control something more precisely than ever before. Step two, and this we do collaborating with hundreds and hundreds of research groups all over the world, make the discovery. Figure out what's actually going wrong in a disease, or discover a pattern that might correct a deficit. And then, design the technology that we translate into a company or into the marketplace. So I'll tell you three short stories today where we're trying to do the invent, discover, design strategy. Two of them have resulted in startup companies, and the third one we're in the process of forming. And I hope that these short stories illustrate this hope that we can actually dig one level deeper in science without losing sight of the hope for practical applications that can make the human condition better. Let's start with a spatial story. We want to understand the complexity of the brain all the way from entire system down to molecule. Now, how can you do that? There are no machines um, that will automatically do all that. I think we've all seen brain scans, MRI scans. Um, they're incredible because they're non-invasive, and that makes them very popular. They're used widely with human subjects, but of course, the spatial 
precision is limited. The little blobs that you see, or voxels that light up, can contain millions and millions of cells that could be doing very different things. Now, at the other extreme, you have microscopes. And that's how brain cells were discovered over 100 years ago, by looking at preserved pieces of brain tissue and trying to see the cells within. But even they're limited. Brain cells are big in their spatial extent, but they're made of really tiny things. And microscopes can't see very tiny things. They're limited because light has a finite size or wavelength, and you can't see things much smaller. So in our group, we often think about doing the opposite of what everybody's doing. And so we started thinking, if people have been zooming in on the brain for over 100 years, what if we did the opposite? What if we take these specimens of the brain and physically blow them up? We expand them and make them 100, 1,000, 10,000 times bigger in size, so you could use inexpensive optics, maybe even hacked cell phone cameras that could be used to detect small things. You could use inexpensive optics to make maps of the brain. How does this work? Well, we started reading lots of papers. And one of the things that became clear is that there's a rich world of chemistry out there. So this is a little animation showing what happens if you take the polymer in baby diapers and add water. The cartoon shows it swelling, as millions of kids do this experiment every day. You add water, the polymer swells, and it turns out the polymer is made of a very charged substance, and charges repel, and so you get this huge, huge swelling of the baby diaper material. So in our group, we started thinking, what if you could weave a dense spiderweb-like mesh of the baby diaper material throughout a piece of preserved brain, winding their way around and between all of the individual molecules? If you did it just right and add water, could you physically make the brain bigger? So we thought about this for a long time, and then we decided to give it a try. And here you can see the result. So in the middle panel, B, is a piece of brain tissue before we expanded it. And on the right-hand side in panel C is the same piece of brain tissue, like a day and a half later, and we polymerized it by infusing this chemical mesh that's a lot like the stuff in baby diapers, and add water, and we've grown the brain. So the hope is, of course, that we make the mesh so dense and so even that we can turn a cell like the one on the left to something like the one on the right, a constellation of biomolecules hovering in space, but with a relative organization preserved, so the information of how the brain is organized is preserved. So if biomolecules are touching, they're now moved apart to some minimum distance, and if there's some minimum distance apart, they're blown up by some scale factor. Now just a brief detour, because this might sound a bit implausible, about how it works. So in these cartoons, I explain how the technology actually works at the molecular scale. These brownish blobs here are biomolecules, and we had to invent little handles handles that will bind to the biomolecules and let us pull them apart. It's like mechanical engineering, but at the nanoscale done by chemistry. So we invented molecules that bind to DNA, to proteins, all the different biomolecular classes is our goal. Then we have to weave that dense spiderweb-like mesh of the baby diaper material. You can't just dump it on top. And so we came up with a chemical process to make these highly charged polymers out of individual tiny, tiny building blocks shown here as little white spheres assembling into long chains. And furthermore, when the chains encounter a handle, they form a bond. So if you think about it, the polymers can swell and the handles convey the force. Maybe we could actually inflate a brain. But there's one last step that we have to figure out. The brain doesn't like being expanded, it's very happy where it is. So we soften it using detergents or heat, and then we add water. The baby diaper polymer swells, but this time, because of the handles, all the building blocks of life will come along for the ride, and we can physically inflate the brain. So, of course, this does not work on living brain tissues, but we can use this on specimens from brain banks, and as I'll show you later, on clinical specimens as well. Here's a little movie just to show you it in action. So this was a polymerized brain tissue, and then we add the water right there. And I hope you can see that this piece of brain tissue is starting to grow before your very eyes. It only takes a few tens of minutes. This is a sped up video, so we shrank it from 50 minutes to one minute. Okay, so we can make a brain many, many times bigger. I'm sure it's only a matter of time before a Hollywood scriptwriter script writer makes a horror movie about this, but... Um, so why is this helpful? Well, if you can make a very detailed map of the brain, see all those wires and connections that, as I described earlier, are so hard to see, maybe you can make a detailed map of the brain so detailed that you could 
can someday simulate things like decisions and thoughts and feelings in software or in a neuromorphic chip. I think this could be very interesting for not just basic science purposes, but potentially would have applications in developing new kinds of artificial intelligence. It also, of course, could help us just understand problems of human psychology that are difficult to explain completely by external observation. So this is sort of a dense slide, but it illustrates a really important point. You can color, color code neurons by putting genes into them that encode for different glowing proteins. So jellyfish have a protein that glows green, corals have a protein that glows red. Anyway, you can put the genes in using clever tricks and make neurons physically have different colors. We didn't invent that. That was developed by a group at Harvard, and they call it Brainbow. But the point I'm trying to make here is that if you look at these Brainbow-colored brains, when you get to the finest wires and connections, like I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, they're too small to see. That's what you see in the top middle of the slide, is these color-coded neurons, and if you zoom in with a lens, it looks fuzzy. But on the right-hand side is after we blew it up with the baby diaper processing method and then took a picture. And I hope what you can see is that the wiring of the brain is now visible. So one of our dreams is, can we make maps of the brain so detailed that you could actually try to understand how the brain computes? And could this lead to new kinds of understandings of how the human mind works or to new kinds of artificial intelligence? This is a movie illustrating kind of the kinds of data that we can collect nowadays. So now we've done with the inventive stage, we're proceeding to the discovery stage, we might learn new things by making brain maps. We might not. It's real science, so there's no textbook here that we're following. But our hope is to make discoveries here that could yield deployable insights in the world of computation, and also to have maps of the brain detailed enough that maybe we can pinpoint where brain diseases begin. So we're collaborating with experts on Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's, and we're opening up new conversations with people about ALS and other uh, conditions of the brain, hoping to figure out where do these diseases really begin. This is just sort of a fun movie, um, which I guess it couldn't play. So I guess we're going to move to the next part, which is if you build a technology for understanding the brain, it often has applications in many other parts of biology and medicine. So we started getting all these calls from people saying, hey, can you detect diseases early? Something like seven out of the 10 leading causes of death, if you diagnose them earlier, you can help save more lives. Now, why is it so hard to diagnose a disease early? Well, it's because the changes are so subtle, right? they're almost looking like normal, in this case, cancer biopsy specimens. So detecting a cancer early would be helpful, but if you can't see it in the specimen because the changes are too tiny, that's not going to help. So we started thinking, let's blow up those tiny changes and make them visible. And so we started doing an um, academic-level trial with breast cancer biopsies, working with several pathologists. It turns out early in breast cancer, the doctors can disagree something like half the time about the diagnosis. So we assembled a team of pathologists, expanded actual breast cancer biopsies, and had the team grade them, and had the votes then used, uh, we used then the votes to train a machine learning algorithm to classify the problems as benign or you know, something to be worried about or normal. And interestingly, the machine learning algorithm was able to do better classification with the expanded samples than with the unexpanded samples. So we've now spun this out as a company, Expansion Technologies, and I think it illustrates this three-part process. Invent, we came up with a way to physically magnify objects. Discover, we started working with experts in different diseases in order to pinpoint what we could actually do. And then design, let's figure out a way to make this into an early diagnosis pipeline. So that's short story number one. I want to tell you a second story. Different topic, but same kind of intellectual infrastructure. This is a story about controlling brain cells. So as I mentioned in the beginning, brain cells compute using short electrical pulses. And so one of the things that we've been wondering for a while is, how could you control them? And ideally, control them very precisely. Could you activate even individual cells to dial in a neural code or neural computation? So my co-inventor, Carl Dysroth, and I started thinking about this um, back in the year 2000 when we were both students and decided if you could install little tiny solar panels in brain cells and then shine light on them, you could control them because you have a device that controls the cell by converting light to electricity, and the light can be precisely aimed at individual cells. Then, of course, you have to bring the light into the brain. This has been uh, mostly done in small animals so far, like fruit flies and fish and mice. 
the brain doesn't feel pain, so you can bring in a probe, and people have been bringing electrodes into the brains of even awake neurosurgical patients in the operating room for decades. You can bring an optical fiber into the brain to deliver the light. So now the question is, where are we going to find a solar panel? And this is where we got really lucky, because the natural world did it for us. It turns out many microbes, like this single-cell green algae, have light-activated proteins that, when they're hit by light, let charge through a membrane. In this case, the algae used the light to then uh, activate this little eye spot highlighted in brown, which we just zoomed into, to control the swimming of the algae. Now, in this eye spot are proteins, and the proteins, when hit by light, in this case blue light, will open a little tiny hole or pore and let charged particles, ions, from one side of the membrane to the other. So in the algae, they use this to swim around. But we started thinking, what if these and other molecules from microbes could be borrowed and transplanted into brain cells? It's exactly the light-activated solar panel that we want. And this is where we got even luckier. Because it turns out that this protein is encoded by a pretty small gene, a small fragment of DNA. And you can take this small piece of DNA out of the algae and paste it into a gene therapy vector, like a virus, and deliver this gene into brain cells. So then we had to hope for the best. This is a gene from an algae, and we looked at other ones from funguses and bacteria. It could just kill the brain cell, right? Or it could be too slow for the fast electrical pulses of the brain. And just all the dots lined up. We were extremely lucky. Brain cells could make these proteins. They even installed them in the right spot. And furthermore, when you shine light on the brain cell, something amazing happened. The molecules were able to open the pore, let the charge through, and activate the brain cell. So in a nutshell, what we're doing is activating the brain cells with light, and they're firing electrical pulses, almost identical to the electrical pulses that are happening in your brain right now, in your auditory and hearing systems as I say these words. OK, so that's the invention. Now the discovery. We started collaborating with lots of people. Um, for example, Professor Li Wei Sai at MIT is an expert on neural oscillations and Alzheimer's and other important scientific topics. Um, so her group took the molecule and put them into a population of cells in the brain that are known as basket cells. They're little star-shaped cells, hence the name basket cells. You can do this selectively by tricks borrowed from the field of gene therapy. Um, you can design viruses that will only infect certain cells and not others, for example. Anyway, when you shine blue light on the brain, then those cells will be activated and not their neighbors. Okay. So her group is, uh, also a lot of, has a lot of expertise in Alzheimer's disease, and they made a really stunning discovery. Starting with mice that are engineered with mutations that mimic what happens in humans with Alzheimer's, they started using our technology, which we call optogenetics. Opto for light, and genetics because these are genetically encoded tools. They implanted an optical fiber in the brain, and they shine pulses of blue light at a very specific frequency, 40 times a second. And amazingly, the brains of these mice got better. They saw decreases in the amyloid plaques and the phosphorylated tau and the other molecular hallmarks of Alzheimer's disease. OK, now how do you make that into a practical therapy? People don't want optical fibers implanted in their brain, and gene therapies are expensive and very, very early stage. So under her leadership, the teams went on to uh, find out that you could induce the same pattern of brain waves through visual stimuli flickering lights that go at the same speed of 40 times a second. The mice would get better. No gene therapy, no light-activated proteins from algae, no implanted optical fibers, just watching through the eyes of flickering light. The teams went on under her leadership also to find out you could add clicking sounds. And so uh, she and I uh, recently co-founded a company, Cognito Therapeutics, which is working on human trials right now, where actual Alzheimer's patients are seeing the flickering lights and hearing clicking sounds, and we're wondering, could you use this to stop Alzheimer's disease? Now, of course, many things don't translate from mice to humans. It's important to point that out. But it's such a simple thing to try, right? It's basically having people watch a movie. We'd be idiots not to give it a go. So again, I think you can see a pattern here. Invented tool, in this case, the optogenetics, which reveals deep science. And then discoveries will emerge, which allow us to understand a disease at a more fundamental level. And then finally, the practicalities of design and deployment. How do you make something that could actually be widely utilized? Now, in our group, 
we've been expanding the tool set even further. You can find these optogenetic molecules all over the tree of life. And so we've been looking at genomes from plants, bacteria, funguses, and trying to come up with molecules that will let people make even more discoveries. We've now found three different classes of molecules, which pump different charged particles into outer brain cells in response to light. And we've given these molecules to literally thousands of researchers all over the world, where they're activating cells and trying to figure out, can you trigger a pattern of brain activity that overcomes a disease state, usually in an animal model disease, such as a fruit fly or a worm or a fish or a mouse? Or can you turn off a pathological pattern of brain activity? So for example, there are investigators trying to shut down epileptic seizures. Suppose you can do that in a mouse model, well, the cells that you target might provide better drug targets for treating humans. Or maybe you can find a non-invasive way to target those cells to treat humans. People are also using these tools to try to activate brain activity patterns to overcome Parkinson's disease in animal models, and then translating those insights into better neural stimulation protocols for human subjects. And the list goes on and on. So again, a tool for science that enables discovery, that enables design. And we have a big culture of teaching, I should point out. The expansion protocols that I mentioned at the beginning of the talk, we've now hosted people from over 350 different research groups from all over the world to come and learn how to use the expansion method. And it's being applied to look at bacteria, it's being applied to look at plants, it's being applied to look at um, immune system cells, and all sorts of other questions. Because it turns out lots of problems of the body have this tension between the large-scale system, which is where the disease is manifest, and the fine-scale details, which is really what you have to think about if you want to build a therapy. OK. So I want to talk about one last story, which again sort of fits this model of invent, discover, and design. But this is a very early stage story, kind of like when I mentioned brain mapping and the possibility to revolutionize AI. It's still at the cusp between invent and discover. We haven't yet. Um, started to deploy this for any particular clinical condition. So what's the idea here? Well, this requires a little bit of a detour to physics. I think you can see how this uh, way of thinking, the invent, discover, and uh, design, applies to many disciplines of science. We started with a chemistry story, let's blow up the brain through a chemical process, and then we went to almost an ecological story, let's find molecules from the natural world that'll let us control the brain with light. And now we have a physics story. So this philosophy, I don't think, is tied to any one discipline of the sciences. It's more of a way of thinking. And I think a lot of research groups specialize in a specific area of expertise, like they might be the best at carbon nanotubes or the best at a certain kind of software. But I would like to think that in our group, we specialize in a way of approaching problems that can span many scientific disciplines. OK, so what's the invention? Well. We were trying to exploit an old piece of knowledge. Brain cells don't go infinitely fast. They fire at a certain rate. So in the engineering literature, you might say they have low pass characteristics. They will fire at certain frequencies that are low, but they're not going to fire at high frequencies, those electrical pulses that I mentioned earlier. The other thing is that they're nonlinear. So what does that mean? Well, maybe an analogy is the easiest way to explain it. I like to think of neurons as acting like little AM radios. So how does an old-fashioned AM radio work? You beam the radio wave across the city. The voice or the music has been converted up to a higher frequency, which then is able to travel across the city better than us trying to talk with our own voices. And then the AM radio receives it. It's a nonlinear low-pass filter, and it extracts the voice by subtracting off the high frequency. And that's how you hear the news or the music on an AM radio. So if you think about it, if brain cells act like that, you could deliver multiple high frequencies to the brain, and the brain would more or less ignore them, the same way that we don't respond directly to the AM radio waves. But if, if they are overlapping, you get a subtraction, and if the subtraction yields a low frequency, maybe you could drive the neurons right there. That's what the cartoon on the left shows. The blue arrows um, on the left and the black arrows on the right are the electric fields that we're playing to the brain with two high frequencies. And where the overlap, the little red cloud, is where you get the difference, which is a low frequency that the brain can follow. OK, so let's take a step back. Enough physics. What's the impact of all this? Well, what it means is you can focus the effects of electricity deep into the brain. And so our hope here 
is to actually be able to target deep regions of the brain to stimulate them. Now, why is that important? Well, earlier I told you about the attempts to use our eyes and ears as portal to the brain. And that's an exciting area. In fact, we're trying to generalize that to other uh, problems like sleep. Uh, we recently spun out a company, Elevind, um, which is trying to see if we can deliver sounds to human subjects to help them sleep better. But what if we're not lucky? There might be many brain regions or brain circuits that go wrong, and we might not always be able to target those through our eyes and our ears. We might need to aim for deeper targets. And that's what this might allow us to do. What have we done so far? So again, we start by collaborating with people, uh, and many neuroscientists, of course, work with, with small animals um, because you can do tests on them. Um, and our cl uh, collaborators actually uh, used this method that we call temporal interference because we're having interference between the two electrical fields, and they showed that they could actually target a deeper region of the brain of a mouse without stimulating the overlying areas. So that's what you see in the bottom part of the slide. You see an area of the brain that's bright green is lighting up. That's because we're using a method of imaging to see uh, activity in the brain. And if you look above the green sort of V-shaped area in the bottom image, you don't see much green above it. So we're excited about this idea that maybe we could actually target deep structures in the brain and correct the computations within um, without simulating the overlying regions. And as of now, we have begun some human studies uh, trying to explore and make those discoveries to see what this technology is good for. So in summary, I've told you three short stories at different levels of maturity where we're trying to practice this way of inventing a deep science tool, helping others make deep science discoveries with it, and then collaborating with them to figure out how we can actually make practical inventions that we can get out to help people. It's very important to point out that these are all still at an early stage. None of these are approved by a regulatory body for use in everyday medicine. Um, our group is relatively young, uh, but we're hopeful that this kind of approach might allow us to build a new kind of translational neuroscience, where we can get people to take a step back and dig one level deeper into problems by using new science tools to reveal hidden mechanisms that might be highly non-obvious. Um, I mean, if we were to walk into uh, a room and try to pitch without having the data, the idea of using a movie to treat Alzheimer's or to treat the brain like an AM radio, that might sound ludicrous. But I hope that this idea of taking a step back and digging one level deeper into the science will resonate um, with more and more people over time. So the final slide, and in some regards, maybe the most important one, you know, we had a chemistry story, we had an ecology story, we had a physics story. This is not just interdisciplinary research. This is omnidisciplinary research. And I feel very lucky to have a lot of people in the group who are experts in lots of different parts of the sciences. Uh, the expansion microscopy project began with two really great then graduate students, Faye Chen and Paul Tolberg, and now half the group works on it. The optogenetics, as I mentioned, began with a collaboration with myself and a psychiatrist, Carl Dyseroff. And the temporal interference story um, uh, was uh, conducted in my group by a postdoc, Nir Grossman. Um, and all of these involve lots of other people that in these kinds of short talks I won't have time to go into. But I'll just end on this slide uh, as we take questions with this idea that we really need to unify the sciences. They become so split but by bringing them together and guided by these principles of discovery and design, maybe we can shed a lot of new light, no pun intended, on conditions that bring a lot of suffering to us and that hopefully we can overcome.